It's a pleasure to finally get to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you too. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to kind of do this in a chronological fashion. That's that's usually the best way to do these things. Um, where, first of all, where are you from? Where were you? Where were you born? And and how did you get your start in life? <laughs> I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I don't think I lived there more than six months as a baby and went to New York and then came out to Wisconsin and lived all over the state of Wisconsin. I was born with a heart problem and at, those, at that time in history they didn't know much about the heart so they just scared my mother to death. But I outgrew that and was a very active person ever since then. <laughs> How did you get interested in, in the field of of health and later, of course, rehabilitation. What was your academic training? Well, my academic training was in uh, pre-medicine, health, and physical education. And I had to, uh, what they call a combination course because back before World War II, I wanted to be able to get a job if I couldn't go right into med school because it was expensive. Uh, and I uh, went to service. I enlisted right after Pearl Harbor and was called to ser service after my third year of college and uh, went into the medical corps as an instructor. As we were having our final bivouac, I had appendicitis out in the field. And that, according to the Army in those days, kept you in the hospital for two weeks and unlimited service for 90 days. So I couldn't go to Officer's Candidate School, so they sent me back to my medical post and uh, I became cadre again. Then they tried to send me to a medical school and our service command had no quota for medicine, so I ended up going to Texas A&M, a branch of Texas A&M, Taunton College, in engineering. I, while I was there, I coached football, I coached track, I uh, did several things because I was repeating my previous schooling, and uh, oh, about the equivalent of the third semester I was there, all of the ASTP courses were closed down and the 90% of us were sent to the infantry. So then I went to the infantry. Uh, when I went to the infantry, the captain called me in one day and he said, you're gonna be my personal runner because I had just won the 100, the 220, the high jump and the broad jump in the division track meet. And uh, so I was a PFC all through the war. Uh, after the war, I was transferred to the first Division, 16th Infantry, and I was made the, sec, uh, the assistant a &R officer, where I had charge of various activities and coaching and had people with captains and majors working under me. <laughs> I was still a PFC. <laughs> how, uh, at, at that point, how did, uh, you know, World War II is, is for many, uh, for many different professions and careers, it's kind of the launching point for uh, a lot of different fields of endeavor. And World War II, because of the large numbers of young men who came back wounded with serious trauma, uh, this really sort of launched, I guess, the, the, the field of rehabilitation studies in, in, in this country. Am I on the right track here? Well, I don't know if that really launched the rehabilitation studies. I think they came uh, much later. Oh, study, yeah. But what it did do, uh, for instance, uh, we had more traumatic paraplegics and quadriplegics uh, created during World War II that were civilians than veterans. But nobody knew where they were because they were farmed from the hospital into a nursing home somewhere or maybe kept at home if they had the means to do that. Uh, with the veterans, we had an agency in which they were all registered so it was the vehicle through which we could start this program. And uh, it was a very important thing to be able to know where they were and reach them. Uh, but from the very first year, we had non-veterans, both men and women, in our program. But it was the veterans that gave us the, the means of developing the program. I should probably re-ask that a little bit uh, along the lines of, at, at the time when you started in this field, what was the situation for people who lived with disabilities? As I, I remember reading somewhere where very few of those folks ever made it to, to college because they weren't sent to school, they were homeschooled. That's true. In fact, uh, we had uh, people coming to us as incoming freshmen that were 49 and 53 years old. 
Uh, one of them I re remember was in bed for 21 years in the heart of the hospital center in Chicago. He came down here for functional training, which we had before the regular semester started. And he went home and he called me up after he got home. He said, if I could learn that in two weeks, what could I learn if I went to college? I said, Jack, you won't be the bum that you are today. He came to college and graduated in three and a half years with almost a straight A average. He came to my office in his senior year and he said, who's going to hire me at my age? I said, Jack, if you walk into the office thinking that way, right, it's going to be conveyed to your employing officer. You go in there and tell him you went to one of the toughest universities in the United States and you're a straight A student and you did this, that, and the other thing. So he did. Two things happened. His first big project had to do with facial cream. And in the publication, they misspelled faces and made it feces. <laughs> and he was very embarrassed. He sent me a copy of that. And he said, Tim, you think I'll still last? But six months later, they made him a vice president of Barsh Medical Advertising Firm in Chicago. We have a lot of dramatic stories like that among our uh, students. Uh, the, uh, the truth is that uh, the veterans were able to identify their experience after disability with experience they had prior to disability. But those that were disabled early in life and not given normal schooling, normal social experience, no normal uh, types of uh, challenges had no concept of the reality of things. So many times they would think that what they were experiencing was just unique to them and not something that was an experience of all people. And this was another way that veterans helped us in guiding the non-veterans in their early years. When, when you came to the University of Illinois, as I understand it, the Rehabilitation Institute was over in Galesburg and they no. were about to shut it down? Uh, actually, the uh, Galesburg was an undergraduate division of the university. It was created at the same time that Navy Pier was created. And it was created to, to absorb not only the returning veterans, but the number of high school graduates who, would not, who could not go to college because they weren't going to go to service. Uh, the difference is that the governor decided to close Galesburg in 1949 and create a geriatrics research institute there, which did not persist. Navy Pier evolved into the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, at the time that they closed uh, Galesburg, we thought our program was lost. And we, I took 20-some driven, paraplegic driven cars to march in the capital. The governor refused to see us. Uh, before I got to Springfield, and this is interesting, I hope it's interesting to you, I called the local police and I didn't want to have us create a traffic problem with 20 some cars in a convoy. About three officers came out and they talked to me for a while and they said, can you wait a minute or two? Yes. A few minutes later, about seven more officers on motorcycles came by. And they led us through town and every intersection, they blocked the intersection so we go through and saluted every one of my veteran cars. When we got to the capital, the Capitol Police and the city police came belly to belly. And I could feel that there was integrity around. I'm, I'm a second year man in Illinois from Wisconsin. I don't know what's going on. But we went to, we parked in the circle drive at the Capitol where it says Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and I thought, oh, we're in trouble. Police said, don't worry about it. When the governor refused to see us, Senator Thompson, who was, I think, the senior senator in the state at the time from Galesburg and who I had had a chance to meet, was going to meet with us over in the armory. So we went over in the armory and we parked everywhere. I couldn't figure out why these officers were so willing to help me. One of them stood up when we were meeting at the armory and said, we want you to know that whatever this redhead wants and whatever you want, you're going to get. I'm sitting there, what's going on? I later found out that they were all officers in the state police force until the governor took over. And at that time, that was under the spoil system. So the governors were fired. I mean, the police officers were fired by the governor. And you know, it's an interesting phenomena. Out of that situation, we got the kind of help we needed to push the issue. The Chicago Tribune had a large picture in it with 
itched in black and said, for whom the bells toll, with myself and Fred Haler, Director of Public Welfare. And that's how we finally got to this campus. We also came to this campus and demonstrated. At one time, I took uh, planks from a scaffolding, paint scaffolding on Lincoln Hall, and put it over the steps, and had my wheelchair fellows wheel up and down to prove they could do it. Uh, we had no budget in the program from the state of the university for eight years. Uh, but I had contracts with the VA, and I had contracts later with the State Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, and we made money on our sports program. Well, that sports program is, is, is a key to this whole thing. Tell me, tell me about the Wheelchair Basketball Association. Well, we founded the Wheelchair Basketball Association in 1949, in spring of 1949, and we con conducted the first national tournament in Galesburg. Uh, actually, uh, again, the bulk of the competitors were veterans, but there were a lot of non-veterans in there. In fact, some were only 14, 15, 16 years old. And that has grown now. It's got over 200 teams and an intercollegiate division for men, an intercollegiate division for women, and all sorts of things. But I developed that, and I developed wheelchair football and a few other sports at that time, because it was a way of projecting these people out into the community, out into the public eye. And the people in the audience could see something common about their participation in the regular sport. They could see them emoting, they could see them arguing with the referee, uh, getting mad, you know, and that said, hey, these are real people. So I credit our sports program with breaking down many of the barriers that we faced back at that time. Mm -hmm. And it also gave it also gave the athletes a real sense of participation and everything else. Well, it did more than that. It overcame their self-confidence. Uh, it, it gave them, uh, or their self-conscious, I should say, and gave them self-confidence. Uh, I had one boy who was a farmer. He left high school, I think, at the end of his sophomore year and enlisted. He came out of the war able-bodied, but had an accident and became a paraplegic. But he didn't have the veterans' benefits that the service-connected veterans had. Uh, he was socially r resistant. I wanted to put him in a ball game. He would practice every day, but he wouldn't go in the ball game. He was afraid. So to get him in a ball game one time, I said, Don, you fall out. Jack, you get kicked out for getting into a fight. You do this. And we got down to four fellows. Then he would win the ball game. He blossomed. He overcame it. And, and I understand I'm still a young man in this field at the time. I'm sitting on the sideline, and he's on the other side of the floor with his chest on his knees. And he comes over like this to see me. I said, oh my God, what have I done? He reached under the bleachers, grabbed the basketball, and sat up like this. You couldn't do that if he was paralyzed the way the VA hospital said he was paralyzed. He learned that on the basketball court. I couldn't have accomplished that in the therapy room. Hmm. So, uh, really, with all our counseling and therapy and all the other services we had, our sports program was a real tool for projecting in the public eye, overcoming self-consciousness, developing self-confidence, and giving them a vehicle that they could convince other people of their ability. You started doing some things here that uh, you know really kind of set the standard. You know. You started with the first curb cuts. You started doing ramps. You started making buildings accessible. That must have been a huge undertaking with a big bureaucracy like a university this size. It was, and because we had taken that initiative and we had written standards for accessibility here on campus, and they later Illinois was one of the first states to have those standards, I later became the director of research for the American National Standards Institute. At that time, it was American Standards Association. And I uh, was Director of Research and Development, Secretary of the Steering and Sectional Committee, and eventually National Chairman of the American National Standards on Accessibility and Usability of Buildings Used by the Public. How did those, uh, you, had a, you did have some engineering background, if I remember from your, your yes. earlier, <laughs> how, how, how did you start to come up with the ideas? They're, they're pretty straightforward, they're, they, make, they just make common sense. Well, I. I, when you're met with a challenge, you have to find a resolve for that challenge. And for about three or four years on campus, I was moving 
three to six hundred sections of class from an inaccessible building to an accessible building. We only had two accessible buildings at that time. That made 600 professors mad at me. So I used that to get them to go to their deans and get some of the money, because the budget was structured different in those days, uh, to do a, just addition to this room or this classroom or this building, whatnot. And it evolved over time. Uh, as we solved problems, I became aware of the need for accessibility and not only accessibility, but usability. It's one thing to get into a building and then not be able to use it. Mm -hmm. Vertical access, uh, facilities like toilets and whatnot. Uh, and because I had done that, they came to me, uh, Washington did a survey and, uh, for the Veterans Administration, and they said that this was the most successful place in the country. As a result of that, the American Standards Association came to me and asked me to be a part of it. And uh, my role was to be the director of research and development. Well, a lot of things grow out of that. It, it's one thing to come up with a set of standards, a set of ideas, but you need legislation to, to implement that, that you need the force of law in many cases to bring people along. Uh, yes, and of course the American National Standard has no strength until a state makes a part of their building code. And that was an interesting experience too. Uh, some states just adopted the American National Standards. Other stand, uh, states insisted on going to, to a procedure of their own. I remember going to one state in the north here, and I asked them, why don't you just adopt the standards? Oh, we have to go through all this by ourselves and substantiate it and then do it. Well, they, they were three years later than the other states in getting it done. But the standards themselves have no strength until enacted into state law or state building standards. Did a lot of people from around the country and around the world come here to see what you had done on campus to get to, to take back those ideas? Oh yes, in fact I hosted uh, the vice presidents and president of uh, Wright State University years ago. I hosted the administrators and faculty from University of Missouri which was one of the programs, the university starter program. I lectured at SIU and I had them, Guy and others come up here and they started a program. It's not persisted in the same way. Uh, we had a lot of visitors from all over the world actually come to see what we had done and how we had done it. And uh, of course that's very gratifying uh, and that was happening before the university recognized what we had done. <laughs> The, uh, I, I, I read also that uh, you started your own bus service here with wheelchair lifts and uh, how, how Our did that bus happen? service started in 1952. Uh -huh. uh, the veterans that were service connected as a part of their benefits received an allowance toward a car. And most of them at that time had Oldsmobile because Oldsmobile had hydromatic shifting. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I used to do I'd prepare a paper and I would say, driver, passenger. And I would say, eight o'clock, driver Smith, pick up Jones from two. And I would print that out every day because we were moving classes every day the first three or four weeks and put it on their bed. And when they woke up, they knew that this guy was supposed to take this fella to that class. And it worked well until I had a very unique experience. One of my wheelchair fellows without a car was borrowing the car from the fellow that had the car. And they were dating the same girl. <laughs> and that stopped that in a hurry. Well, about that time I said, I've got to find a better way to do this. So I started looking into developing buses. Uh, two parents came down to visit with me. And one of them had uh, an association with Greyhound Bus Company. Orville Swan Caesar, the founder and still president of Greyhound. So they asked me to go up with them and see him. He offered me as many buses as I wanted. Well, I was afraid to, I was thinking to myself, oh, I could get a bus for every team in the United States. I said, no, I better stick to two. I came back to campus, wrote out all the evidence we had. Don Swift, one of my wheelchair students, and I went and visited the buses and whatnot. Presented it to through channels and it went nowhere absolutely nowhere. So I went over to my dean at the time and I said, 
what's happening here? He said, well, you can't give the bus, university buses. I said, I don't want to give the university buses. I want the president to know that Greyhound wants to give us buses. Jim McManus and Hugh Calkins came down, met with me, went over and talked to the dean, came back and said, how can you live with this? I said, I have no choice. So we established a parents' organization for disabled students, two members, printed a letterhead. They sent a letter direct to the president, which I could not do at that time. I had to go through channels. And President Maury accepted it in 24 hours and commended me for it. But by that time, all the buses that Greyhound had had been given to other groups and sent sold out of the country. Hugh McManus and Hugh, or Jim McManus and Hugh Calkins, and Jim McManus was an attorney, secretary of the Skill Corporation. They went to see Mr. Caesar, and Mr. Caesar said this, Tim Nugent is either a damn fool or a damn liar if he thinks I'm going to pay insurance on $500,000 buses while he makes up his mind. And it took them hours to explain that I was not at fault. So he finally said, I'll get buses to if I have to go out of the country. He went down to Mexico. The buses came back. They, some of them didn't have glass in certain windows. They were in dilapidated shape. Carmen Blitz, who did all the engineering on my buses for years after that, called me up at one in the morning and said, Tim, can you be here by 7? I said, yes. Please be here. He showed me the bus. He said, Tim, what are we going to do? He and Jim McManus and Hugh Calkins and I met for hours at Gene and Georgie at his restaurant all day long. I finally convinced them that we cannot embarrass the university by free from these buses. We can't insult Orville Swan Caesar. It wasn't his fault. So Carmen says, Tim, I'll refurbish those buses. If you can just raise the money to, for the material. So he did. He put the first lifts in buses that you could wheel in the front door and walk in the front door. And that was the second generation that he did. Uh, I had to pay him for some of the outside funds I had raised for that amount. It was $11,000. From that day on, he installed the lifts and maybe, I would say, 15 to 20 buses we've had over the time. Highway buses and uh, city buses. No cost to us. And he did it without patenting anything. He made it available to the world. The VA came and wanted buses like that. They came to me and then to Comrade Blitz, and he made six for them. Uh, he was a true, it's just one of those people that came to my rescue, my help, at a critical time in my career and stayed with me for years until he died. That's a terrific story. Yeah. I think it's a, a story that people should know. Yeah. Um, how, how did the curriculum start to develop around here? You, 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 you were doing things that worked. You were doing serious studies. There was research being done. How did this all start to evolve into what we have today here? Well, I don't know if I can really pinpoint that. It, it's something that t takes place gradually over years. Uh, I would have uh, masters and doctoral students assigned to me for research. And I would give them a subject that was one of the things I was looking into. And many of the things that grew out of their research ended up as a part of the standards. Also, for instance, Chuck Elmer, who was my chief of therapies for many years, even after I retired, was doing his master's degree with us. And I asked him to do the research on ramps. We had been doing ramps for years, but now we were getting to the point that we had to prove that what we were doing was right. Mr. Dr. Florio in safety education at the U of I here, and Chuck got together, they got funds. We built a ramp that was adjustable 64 lengths, pitches, and combinations of length and pitch. And we ran students of all different disabilities up and down that. And we could change it to this, 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 or continue. And that was published. But we found that our students who had been taking physical therapy and we had been trained were able to do more than the average person was. So we had to lessen our requirements. But that was written into the American National Standard. That's just one example. Wow. How, how, did, how did the uh, 
you know, we talked a little bit about how standards were developed over the years, and of course, uh, there were different pieces of legislation, the Rehabilitation Act of 73, fair housing amendments, and then culminating with the Americans with Disability Act. Uh, how, how did you play a role in, 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 in pushing those through? I know that Paul Simon was, was, was big in the area as well. He, he, he got behind that. Well, sometimes I think I get more credit than I should, but uh, I lectured all over the United States and even in foreign countries about American standards. I lectured to the British, uh, uh, British Academy of Architecture, what I don't know the proper name right now, but uh, I lectured all over the world and all over the United States on this. I met with various groups like the American Plumbing Association, uh, the American Home Builders Association, and various groups like that. Uh, to, to help convince them that this is something that should be done. Architects and uh, others in the building profession thought that by doing this, they would increase the cost of the buildings and they would consume a lot of extra space. So my mission was to show that we could do it in the space that was available. And of course, they've improved upon that over the years. Uh, the effort was one that involved getting all the groups like the American and, uh, Academy of Cerebral Palsy, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. I, I lectured to all those groups about this and about other things as well. It's interesting that when we asked the AMA to join our committee, they refused. They didn't think they wanted to get involved in anything like this. Uh, so, did, so did other groups, but when it was done, they wanted to be a part of it. And it's just a phenomena of attitudes and behavior and how they evolve and what you have to do to cope with them. When, when that bill was packed, uh, when, that, when the act was passed and signed, I believe it was by the first President Bush, were you, were you there at the ceremony for that? No, I was not there okay. at the ceremony. Um, I'm, I was asking about that because I actually have videotape of it because uh, uh, Paul Simon was there. I was just curious. Uh, but when, when you heard that this act had been signed, what was the feeling? Of, what kind of sense of satisfaction did you have that this, all this work had finally paid off? Well, I had uh, a great deal of satisfaction that it was being recognized and reinforced. But the truth of the matter is most states had enacted that prior to that. Uh, and there was not a consistency among the states. Each had certain attitudes or interests that prevailed. The Federal Act brought it all together and it was, it was very important in that regard. Um, there's, um, um, I'm trying to get to over the years as the program uh, developed and grew, uh, rehabilitation now goes, extends to a, lot, a much wider range of issues than physical disabilities. How has the center reached out to uh, persons who have, let's say, learning disorders, the, the brain injured? Uh, uh, a very, very large number of students that are here at the university and are being serviced by the Division of Rehabilitation and Education Services and now it's called the Disability Resource and Educational Services, excuse me, uh, are learning disabilities, brain injury, and things like that. We had a few way back in the beginning years, but they were hidden even more than the ones with physical disability were. Uh, but now there's a very large number, and, the, and Dr. Hedrick and the staff and the college have done much to, to support them and alleviate the conditions so that they can pursue normal academics and they're doing a wonderful job of it. It must, have, it must have been just a really, as you look back, it must have been just a really neat thing to be kind of at ground zero as this whole thing took off and, and has grown into an international movement. Uh, what are your thoughts at this point in life about what you've seen happen, not only here but around the country as a result of what was accomplished? Well, of course, I'm, I'm pleased that these ideas were accepted and that they've been uh, enforced and, and strengthened and even improved upon. Uh, it's a very gratifying thing. Uh, I don't 
take that gratification easy because I remember how it was at the beginning. <laughs> and uh, I could tell you some real horror stories about people actually going out of their way to try and get rid of me. And uh, they don't belong here right now, but I, I was gratified, but I also uh, was a bit uh, disturbed by the fact that everybody wanted to put something into it to change it. Everybody wanted something to be identified with them. And it took a lot of effort on the part of some people to keep it as a standard that was uniform. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the, when, when did you retire, Dr. Newton? I retired in 85. 85. How, uh, how have you remained uh, active with, with the Institute and with, uh, with, with the, uh, with the Well, field? I still serve on uh, different committees and uh, in different roles. I'm still very much involved with aspects of, of research in different areas. And I'm also involved uh, with the sports program. I'm still on the Hall of Fame Committee for the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. I haven't missed a national tournament in 63 years. And uh, God willing, I won't miss any until I can't. <laughs> uh, it's, it's part of my reason for being. And it, it gives me uh, the motivation to try and stay as active as I can stay. No question about that. As, as you look back, what, what gives you the greatest personal satisfaction over, over what, uh, what's been accomplished? This has really been a, a place and an, an ethic that's changed people's lives, one person at a time. Well, I'm, I'm happy <clears throat> that it's all been accepted, let's put it that way. Uh, I'm happy for the growth that's taking place in those areas. I'm happy for the fact that uh, so many people with severe permanent disabilities are now able to go into the field of employment and get good jobs. Uh, we have a high percentage of our graduates that get jobs right out of school. And many of them earn many, many, many times more than I have earned. In fact, may I give you an example? Please. One of our wheelchair athletes who graduated Retired at the age of 50, has dedicated $1,400,000 to our program. Wow. I couldn't do that if I hocked everything I own, including my wife. <laughs> and we have other of our wheelchair graduates that have contributed immeasurably to our program. And many of our graduates have helped our more recent graduates getting out in the world, into jobs and whatnot. So it's a chain reaction. And when I see that, I'm very happy. <laughs> well, it's a big network. Yeah, yeah, no question about that. As you look at new new technologies and new advances, what do you uh, what do you think are the most exciting things out on the horizon for for your field? I mean, we're seeing so many things with nanotechnology, and uh, you know, it's really well, exciting. Uh, I'm not as adept at the new technology as some of the younger people are. In fact, some of it frightens me. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the future is a bit confusing because uh, as we rely more on some of these technologies, we're getting away from the involvement of the full body process. Uh, I don't know if that's a good explanation or not, but there are things in the future that concern me. I don't, can't elaborate upon them as effectively as I would like to, but uh, for instance, America was a leader for years. It isn't anymore. And I, I'm concerned for our government. I'm concerned for what things are happening in government. Uh, I'm concerned for uh, what's happened in Illinois. Uh, th these are disastrous things. I think part of it is that we are beginning to rely so much on technology that we're forgetting the impact we have to have on the individual himself to, to teach integrity and honesty and, and the things that really matter. And this concerns me. Yeah. There was one thing, there was something I meant to ask about. I did not ask about it earlier. Uh, what do you think of the new Nugent Hall that they've built here? <laughs> it's fabulous. Uh, 
when they had their dedication, my son and daughter-in-law and grandson, grandchildren were there. I couldn't get them out, out them out of the dining room. And when you see it, you'll see it's, it's unlike any dining room in the world. There's no lines. There's this type of food here, this type of food here, this type of food here, this type of food here. No waiting. You get anything you want. It's absolutely beautiful. And the dormitory is beautiful. A person who is paralyzed from the neck down does not have to fool with a, a key la, a slide or a door handle. He just waves the card in front of a light here and the door opens. The tenants that help the people that are severely disabled in the very, very first year or two, we, we go from one level to the next level until they're independent in the whole system. Uh, they have tracks in the ceiling that they can lift the, out, the person out of bed and take them to the toilet room or the shower or wherever. All the beds and desks and tables are adjustable. It's, it's beyond my widest, wildest dreams. And the interesting thing is that the director of that facility is the wife of one of our former wheelchair athletes. The assistant director is the wife of one of our former wheelchair athletes, the latter being a professor in architecture, the other one being an independent enterprise. Uh, so there it's a carryover again uh, of, of the beginning. Nothing succeeds like success, huh? <laughs> uh, I guess that's a, a true saying, yeah. Um, is there anything I've missed? I think I'm pretty much at the end of the questions for the, uh, for the, uh, for the Lincoln piece, but uh, I did want to ask you, uh, uh, what was your reaction to getting the Lincoln Award? I was very surprised and, uh, of course, very humbled. And uh, it was something I never experienced. I was told at the time of the convocation, the woman that introduced me and made the presentation told me that she had nominated me over 20 years ago and that the governor had vetoed it. Oh. Was that Gail Pyatt who nominated you? Who, do you know who nominated you? Uh, at the time she first nominated me, she was Mrs. Hirschfield. Oh. Now, I'm sorry, I've a lapse of memory right now, okay. but I, I can't. Oh, I, I've got the tape back at the uh, office. Uh, okay. A very gracious woman, very oh. gracious woman. And uh, she came up to me and she said, I want you to know that I nominated you 20 years ago and the governor vetoed it. <laughs> Well, so it's funny how these things work out, but I'm, yes. glad, I'm glad that it worked out for you. So, so I, I never did expect anything like that. And of course, uh, President Stanley Eikenberry and people like that were pushing for my nomination, which I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. 